Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Dan Maines, and I'm an anthropologist and faculty member here at the Honors College uh, at the University of Oklahoma. And before I get um, introduce our guest, just before I forget, I want to be sure to thank um, the Center for Peace and Development, uh, the Security and Context Network, African Studies Institute, and the Department of Anthropology, um, all for uh, supporting this event. So I'm really excited uh, about this talk uh, that we have today. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Techie Collins. Um, she holds a, a PhD in anthropology from Duke University, and Dr. Collins is an assistant professor of anthropology at Indiana University. And I find her work extremely interesting. Uh, Dr. Collins offers a very fresh perspective on within Ethiopian studies and within anthropology more generally. Um, her work uses beer brewing in Ethiopia as a lens to understand the kind of peculiar relationship between privatization and the developmental state uh, in Ethiopia. Um, Dr. Collins, in some of her articles, really takes categories like uh, privatization as an ethnographic object to be understood as techniques of governance that are formed through practice and develops some very interesting um, analysis of both political economy um, and the developmental state. And one of the things that I really like about her work is that she really weds a close analysis of political economy with attention to culture, religion, and national identity that I think we're going to hear, <clears throat> hear more about today. So I'm really looking forward to this talk and the discussion that will follow. Um, one note on questions. Um, you can use the Q&A function uh, to, to pose your questions. And then after Dr. Collins' talk, um, I'll come back and I will um, introduce uh, the questions. We should have about 15 to 20 minutes of uh, discussion uh, after the talk. So please just post your questions using the, the Q&A function um, if you have any. Um, so with that, uh, really looking forward to your talk. And um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Collins. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, so hello everyone. I hope uh, you all are having a lovely Thursday evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk today and I'm glad to be presenting my research to the African Studies Institute, the Department of Anthropology and the Center for Peace and Development at uh, University of Oklahoma. Before I begin, I just want to take a moment to thank Professor Daniel Maines uh, for inviting me to speak, as well as anyone here or not here whose labor might have gone unnoticed in organizing this event. Uh, with that, uh, let's jump into my talk entitled Drinking as a Site of Consumptive Political Fantasizing, Alcohol, Conflict, and Development in Ethiopia, which is a serious talk, but also, I hope, a fun one for you all to enjoy. So. Fires to the north, fires to the south, to the east and to the west. Trapped in the city of Addis Ababa, I panicked as the surrounding flames blazed, threatening to enter the city center. An escape, I needed an escape, but how? The airport, if I can only get to the airport. A sudden jolt and a gasp, it was a nightmare. The flames were not real, no need to get to the airport, I was safe. Gazing at the ceiling as I laid in the early morning darkness of my bedroom, a sense of dread loomed, as I, like many in the country, were anxious, frightened, and unsure of the future. It was January 2018. It was nearing the end of 18 months of fieldwork in Ethiopia. I'd come to study the country's burgeoning beer industry as a case to think about development and modernity in Africa. In the 2010s, after decades of being characterized as a site of economic despair and decay, Ethiopia had only recently begun to be recognized as a place of rapid growth. An article by Time magazine entitled, Forget the Bricks, Meet the Pines, declared Ethiopia, along with Nigeria, Indonesia, and the Philippines, the newest emerging markets, a new frontier for international companies that want to invest, expand, and find new customers. Nor is this logic more visible than the privatization and liberalization of Ethiopia's brewing industry during the early 2010s, as a sector which was primarily state-owned was now entirely dominated by multinational alcohol companies such as Heineken, Diageo, Castel, all determined to expand the reach of their bottled beers to even the most remote parts of the country. However, 
From the beginning of my research, I found, found myself embroiled in patches of conflict erupting across the country. From reports on tragedies such as the 2016 Arachia Stampedes, to the whispers from distribution networks about unrests in the outskirts of the city, marks of violence outlined the roads as I traveled by car outside of the city to visit breweries and barley farms, burnt vehicles and piles of rocks on the sides of streets marked violence. And then there were the close calls, near escapes of attacks and threats against my own life over my own Ethiopian ethnicity experienced firsthand. Looking back, these experiences were signs of things yet to come, tensions brewing before an ultimate blowout. A little more than a year after my fieldwork ended, there was a fatal coup d'etat in the Amara region, or a failed coup d'etat in the uh, Amara region. In June 2020, a prominent Oromo singer was killed and several activists imprisoned, leading to widespread protests in the Oromo region. And it wasn't too long after that civil war between Tigray People's Liberation Front, TPLF, and the PM Abbey's governments broke out with disastrous effects for the people in Tigray. Awake in my room that January night, I was faced with an unfortunate truth. My research on beer had taken a dark turn. In Western psychology, there have been numerous debates over the meaning of dreams or nightmares as a form of wish fulfillment. However, in Ethiopian society, dreams take on spiritual or even prophetic meaning with symbols taking on a religious cultural context. Whether my dreams were revelatory of the traumas experienced during field work, a wish to end my field work, and or a harbinger for the war to come. What began as a research project on the economy heralded for its success ended with a reality of violence, conflict and war in Africa or a war and a violence, conflict, conflict and disappointment. The relationship between development and conflict and war in Africa is a long-standing problem. Whether arising from local disputes over equity playing out through ethnic conflict, unemployment, land disputes, and competing access to state resources, or structural issues such as the effects of neoliberal reforms, corporate oversight and concessions, and or the coercive ambitions of a centralized state's high modernist projects, development and conflict can be mutually exclusive. And the close ties between the two have often led many scholars and practitioners to adopting a pessimistic view of the continent, the belief that development projects will ultimately end badly. However, I do not take this approach. Instead, I seek to understand the causes as it relates to the conflicting meanings people assign to their past, present realities, and future hopes, and how these differences often come to a head in pursuit of any developmental project. Specifically, I want to think about how conflict and development plays out through material culture. For example, Anthropologist Mike McGovern examines the demystifying program, a modernizing state building initiative in post-colonial Guinea, which targeted unwanted pre-colonial religious material. Banned as the state sought to build a top-down national culture, such an initiative found itself stuck between two competing frameworks, Pan-Africanism, the desire to mean a distinctly African past, and Marxism, that is the tenets of scientific socialism, ultimately leading to state-sponsored iconoclasm or violence targeting the banned material culture. Post-colonial prohibitions of the production of indigenous alcohols across the continent were also sites of modernizing uh, projects in two very distinct ways. First, the banning of traditional alcohols that were seen as opposing state modernizing goals. And on the, I think on my uh, left, but maybe you're right, uh, is a, a picture of uh, Jawala uh, beer, which is produced by the South Sotu people from the Sotu. Uh, and it for a long time was banned as a, as a kind of uh, drink by the apartheid South African government, which um, there were there are multiple reasons for this. One is sort of to cut people off from their ancestors, as this was a religious project project, but it was also to control the production of alcohol. But again, these kinds of uh, not only in South Africa but in other places, traditional beers or uh, drinks were seen as, um, in a way, I would say like backwards, and therefore 
before there were regulations on how much a community could produce. So that's one level. And secondly, there's the banning and regulation of informal distillation uh, and brewing of what they might call new generation drinks or illicit alcohols that are a lot more um, new. Uh, this this uh, picture taken from Al Jazeera is of Shanghai and uh, it's it's a it's it's kind of like a kind of like a moonshine that they make in Kenya. There's also Waraje, which is like very similar in Uganda, uh, and there is an attempt to regulate this because it's very dangerous. Even just looking from this picture, you can kind of tell the production of this is probably something uh, that you might not want to drink. Uh, but also, there is a, a kind of pushing against a, a modernity that is undesirable, right? One that is associated with, you know you know, overpopulation and crowds and, you know, in slums, this is this is a kind of undesirable modernity where more indigenous alcohols are kind of pushed against because they're seen as traditional and not um, modern. So similarly, I want to show how beer brands in Ethiopia capture the tensions uh, between, uh, as they relate to sort of the promises of modernity in Africa. However, unlike these examples that I've given, beer brands are not explicitly a site of state violence and contestation. The case with beer is more subtle as political imaginations attach the meanings of beer brands, assumes often contradictory and sometimes uh, irreconcilable understandings of Ethiopian past, present and futures in the mindset of its drinkers. So drawing from ethnographic research in bars, restaurants, hotels, and groceries in the capital city of Addis Ababa, in this paper, I argue that beer brands are a site of what I call consumptive political fantasizing, or the ways in which competing nationalist imaginings of an Ethiopian modernity circulate through the consumption of alcohol in alcohol-related media. Well, what beer one chooses to drink or not drink does not merely reflect one's individual preference or even habitus, but can also be an ideological choice, demonstrative of a set of ideas and beliefs that correspond to a particular vision of, for the country's future. In the Ethiopian case, competing beer brands signal discordant visions rooted in dueling ex interpretations about the nation's past and present and tension underlying the promises of modernity. Such a modernity is neither apolitical nor solely conceived in opposition to a Western other, but in fact is multiple, endemic, and rife with local rivalries that in many ways are illustrative of a long-standing question of why the project of development in Africa, as in the case of Ethiopia, so often rapidly collapses into civil, into war and civil unrest. And we're going to return to this slide um, in, in, in a, in, as I, we continue on with this discussion. So, Michael Dietler states that alcohol is, quote, a special class of embodied material culture, unquote, which serves as, quote, a salient example of what Mouse refers to as a total social fact, as it constitutes an especially revealing focus of analysis for anthropologists and historians, end quote. For him, the embeddedness of alcohol is a social life as in social life serves to the, for, to the study of total the totality of culture, a comprehensive view. This arises from alcohol's unique material properties, which categorizes the object as being both food and drug, or food with a difference. In the spirit of Dietler, I also approach alcohol as a drug and food that creates a kind of semiotic instability. As a food, alcohol indexes the richness of social life as a marker of cultural, linguistic, racial, ethnic, religious, political, gendered, generational, and class identities. But as a drug, alcohol's psychoactive and intoxicating properties makes it a potent and paradoxical agent of social tradition, transformation, transgression, and trauma. Considering this, I ask, in what ways do competing beer brands evoke contested nationalist imaginings of what an Ethiopian modernity is and should be? And to what extent are these nationalistic uh, imagining sites of possible schism within a nation. Paul Manning argues that beer brands produce a kind of dual lineage, a mixture of tradition and an indexing of European technology. Therefore, 
brands are kind of genre faced uh, object due to this kind of indexing of both consumer and producers, as well as existing material worlds of commodities and immaterial worlds of signs. In this way, the relationship between brand tradition, modernity, and nationalism is a salient one as brands index local symbols and tie them to modernist projects. Thus, over this talk, I analyze how fraught meanings are laden in associations people make with beer. The talk is divided into three parts. The first focuses on how conflict manifests in associations with beer brands in Ethiopia. The second looks at how beer comes to symbolize modernity. And the third will explore how these tensions manifest beer in beer advertisements, which tout the promises of modernity in Ethiopia before concluding with a few questions um, that I think my research raises. Um, but before I begin, I want to address how I define modernity um, and I do so in two very distinct ways. Numerous scholars have studied how commercially brewed and distilled alcohols have come to symbolize modernity in Africa, as opposed to indigenous alcohols, which index a uh, traditional past. Overall, these scholars illustrate how beer, the beer bottle becomes symbolically tied to post-colonial nationalist promises of modernization and material development. However, there are a few assumptions in this literature First, the, the meaning of beer as associated with modernity is approached as an apolitical and you know, uncontested category. This does not mean that scholars haven't given attention to the local political dynamics underlying alcohol. In fact, they have done so very well through social history, but they haven't explored how alcohol itself embodies conflict. Thus, drawing on the work of Charles Pio, I approach modernity as being as much of a spatial question that is located in place as it is a temporal one that is being of a particular milieu. Breaking from the stereotype of categorizing Africa as being traditional or existing outside of modernity, Africa is very much part of the modern and or postmodern moment. However, unlike Europe, the African modernity is informed by a lived experience at the peripheral and not at the center of industrializing capitalist processes, thus recognizing the interconnectedness of our world's political and economic systems and its shared global history. Second, I approach modernity as being both endemic and multiple, or as Don Donham describes it, modernity is a local, culturally uh, encoded stance towards history, one that yearns to bring things up to date. In this way, modernity draws from a national past to imagine possibilities for the future, or what he calls vernacular modernisms. But also there's a recognition of how these modernisms are charged with local resistance, rejections and reactions, and rarely run in stable or cleanly distinguishable lines. Bottled beer brings the promise of being modern or even global through consumption practices. It is an embodied material culture through which development is effectively and imaginatively expressed. The crisp golden lager with smooth finish, free from grainy lumps, consistent in its quality, is aspirational. With each sip, beer comes to embody progress, imaginations of an orderly, stable future through commercial brewing. This is, an this is opposed to subsistence economy of indigenous alcohols with their unpredictable standards, alcohol content and taste, unfiltered residue floating within an open plastic canister, a thing of the past. However, as I've emphasized thus far, this modernity is not without its tensions. Charged by local religious, social, political, ethnic affiliations and revulsions, it is a modernity marked by divisions existing within the context of people's lived experience in a country as wrought by political unrest and, 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 rest and ethnic tension as it's filled with soaring op optimism for the future. In Ethiopia, consumers read their local rivalries into different beer brands. Because of this, alcohol multinationals often find themselves embroiled in these local rivalries, whether intentional or not. And I've just put up some, um, you know, the, the different kinds of, you know, advertisements and sources on the kind of relationship between beer and modernity by different scholars uh, on, on this slide is over here to see as well. So. Beer brands and some of their meanings. One winter morning, I was out with a distributor on the outskirts of the capital city to fulfill a maintenance request for a draft machine. It was early and the bar was filled with a few day drinkers while the staff fixated on an episode dubbed Turkish drama on an elevated flat TV 
As he began the process, he turned towards a few drinkers. He shakes his head and makes half-jokingly comments. In reference to the entire room, drinking Zavidar beer. Me? What do you mean? I, I didn't know the word. It sounded like seed. It could be something about lineage, I thought. He laughed and didn't want to continue. I persisted. Is it like Biharawi? And he whispered, yes, it is. And quietly he said, um, he, he quietly said, Biharawi is the Amharic word for national. In Ethiopia, people will support beer brands based on ethnic and political sentiment. Zebidar brand is Gurage, Raya is Tigray, Har for Har, and Dashin is the Wayana Bira associated with the ruling party at the time. After leaving the bar, the distributor and I would switch topics, discussing how Dashin beer suffered because of these types of affiliations. But he was neither the first nor the last person to point out this controversy to me. Throughout my research, there were widespread boycotts against Dashin across the country for being the mongest government beer. However, Dashin Beer is not the only company to incite political sentiments. When first entering Ethiopia, Heineken fell into conflict with the Oromic ethnic group when it hired popular Amara singer Teddy Afro, who stated in an interview that, for me, Minalik's unification campaign was a holy war. Minalik II's march into central southern Ethiopia over a hundred years ago is seen as a genocide-like massacre in the eyes of many Oromo peoples. Such comments spurred a hashtag boycott Badele campaign against Heineken. Other brands like Abisha and St. George have avoided ethnic association, but they find themselves embroiled in football conflict through their sponsorship of rival team St. George versus Buna Club. Soccer stadiums have become political uh, battlefields over imperialistic implications of alcohol multinationals in Ethiopia. For example, St. George beer is associated with Ethiopia's anti-imperialistic past as St. George is the saint that is said to be responsible for leading Abyssinians into a historic victory against the Italians at the Battle of Adowa. But for many Bunas of Buna's young supporters or Abisha drinkers, the company is an object of scorn. Viewed as a corrupt multinational company, they scream, Bira Musana, beer corruption. And finally, some brands like Metabeer signal lower classes due to its association with drunkenness. For example, one day I was having lunch at a bar near the African cafe in Piazza. Seated next to me were a pair of sailors who, wor who work off a ship that ports in Djibouti. They are on holiday and are basically getting drunk. They recommend that I try a house drink, a mixture of Sprite, Badele special beer, white wine, a bit of gin, before the conversation turns to beer. They tell me that despite what alcoholic content says on the label, there's a vast difference between brands. He says, for example, that when Walia first came, it was good. You could easily get drunk off of it. But now they water it down. He says Abasha is good beer that gets him drunk, and so is Meta. He tells me that St. George is weak. You drink St. George when you're at the expo or the bazaar with the family. He can do 20, or he can drink 20 and still do gulbat sara, physical work. He says that after five to six metas, he's good and drunk. Then he tells me there's a drink at meta bars called cellar that is a great way to get people drunk fast. Despite the flagship beer brands having similar alcohol content, St. George 4.7, Abisha 0.5, Dashin 4.8, Walia uh, point, uh, 5, uh, Meta 5, uh, I think 4.7, 5, 4.8, 5, and 5. So they're pretty much the same. People are adamant that some beer brands are far more powerful than others, specifically Meta. One bar owner told me that he hides the Meta beer, putting it only a certain, an, a certain amount on display because he knows who drinks it. Those persons get so drunk, they take off the label, stick it on their head, parading around, roaring like they are lions. The metal, metal label has a, a lion on it, so that's, that's why they're roaring like a lion. Uh, due to this association with drunk and riotous behavior, Meta brand is seen as lower crass or fara backwards, as one drinker so explicitly stated when I asked him if he drank Meta. And I, and I have a, a, a group of beers here um, with different kinds of associations that I found were uh, made with them. Um, this does not sort of exclude, you know, some people have personal preferences, you know, because they, you know, they choose things based on taste. But, you know, a lot of people have these kinds of identity affiliations that they make with different brands. And oftentimes they pit one brand against the other based on nationality, uh, sports, uh, uh, 
historical issues that might arise depending on who are the main sponsors uh, of the beer. Um, you know, with St. George, there might be some kind of like religious affiliation. Um, and with Meta, I, you know, I, I found that there was uh, some kind of class connotation attached to it. Attached to it. I want to say though that these meanings are changing. It might be interesting to see, you know, how they've changed over the past few years, uh, even. And one great case of how meaning has changed is meta beer, which in if you you know when I would especially talk to you know older you know Ethiopian men, they would especially diaspora, uh, they would talk about how meta used to be this really you know revered beer like equivalent to sort of Saint George. Um, it, it, it's one of the older brands. It had a I would say a connotation that was much more positive, but over time, um, I think, you know, if you talk to a beer executive, they would say that Meta lost uh, the advertising wars uh, against sort of St. George, uh, but over time it has lost its status, um, which is just to say that none of these meanings are set in stone, they're fluid, they're changing, and they're shifting, um, but when I was doing research at my time, these, these are the kinds of uh, associations people were making. But overall, I think the main point is that beer is a site of tension along ethnic, political, historical imaginings and class lines. But also now, now you know that we've sort of talked about this. It's like how does beer also come to signify modernity, development, and progress? So today, indigenous brewing and alcohol production practices tied to the household and informal economy are being challenged by aggressive large-scale commercial brewing. The increase of commercial beer production is often tied to the decreased consumption of indigenous alcohols as companies quickly expand into national territory in a determined effort to replace indigenous alcohols with local uh, commercial lagers. I say local because they're produced in the country, but, you know, they're, they're the, the, the owners are a multinational company. As one respondent says, Areke, Allah and Taj, no one drinks them anymore, he said. People have moved on to beer. Before, beer was a drink for those who had a lot of money, while draft beer was for those who had some capital. Now everyone drinks beer. Although what's somewhat a hyperbolic statement, the point is founded on changing demographics as beer becomes more readily available and affordable for consumers. And it's important to note that over the past few years, alcohol multinationals have destroyed old Soviet distribution networks and replaced them with energized entrepreneur uh, youth banking their future on delivering beer across the territory. They send out draft cleaners responsible for maintaining standards of draft machines in restaurant bars and groceries and hotels across Ethiopia to pave the effective infrastructure needed for beer companies to penetrate local markets. They invest in retail outlets to foster good relationships of reciprocity through gift exchange or bribes, depending on how you want to see it, as companies attempt to curry local favor. They also engage in massive advertising campaigns on television, radio, print, and social media, promoting their local brands. In breweries, multinational alcohol companies facilitate the arrival, installation, and management of smart technology systems, restructuring of the labor force to keep up with the industry con competitors and to meet the needs of the global factory regime. And finally, determined to cut production costs by sourcing grain locally, they collaborate with smallholder farmers, NGOs, and the state, local, regional, and federal to grow local malt barley, to help grow the local malt barley supply to meet the needs of the nation's breweries. With the privatization of beer companies, beer is no more a symbol of distinction, but a commodity available even to those living in the most remote parts of the country. Beer is everywhere with several brands to choose for, and this availability has led to shifting prestige distinctions and the reclassification of traditional alcohols in the imaginary of the public. So, you know, so to think about beer and modernity, there's, again, like a lot of literature um, that talks about, like, how beer is tied to sort of the image of modernity and advertising but also, you know, the arrival of these multinational companies have led to a kind of uh, seismic shift in the industry in terms of practices and the importing of massive technologies um, and the, the attempts to rearrange farming practices in order to meet the, you know, the, the needs of uh, breweries. So, so there is this kind of connection between, you know, not only beer and modernity, but the actual developmental process. So in terms of thinking about 
you know, how people are viewing uh, traditional alcohols in relationship to uh, the, the rise of beer. I want to look at two, uh, the three different uh, different kinds of alcohol. I want to look at ala, areke, and taj. So let's begin with ala, which is the most commonly produced indigenous uh, beer in Ethiopia, historically associated with Christian holidays. It can be brewed from barley, wheat, maize, millet, sorghum, taif, or other uh, cereals. The procedure varies between ethnic groups, but it takes about six to eight days to prepare and has an alcohol content of about 5%. Allah has been undergoing a steady decline in consumption in Ethiopia, as one manager at a beer company proudly declared. Before we arrived, Allah was more popular than bottled beer. We basically destroyed it, and now more people drink beer. We've remade the market. Although steadily diminishing, the practice of drinking Allah for religious holidays is still prevalent. Many people drink it alongside bottled beer now, actually. However, one individual put it, you know, for the holidays, like Mascaram and Gabriel, they used to brew Allah, but now most people just buy a case of beer. It's much easier. The only thing people continue to do is the bunna ceremony, rather than drink coffee from a machine. This comparison between diminishing tala and the longevity of buna arguably can be described as a question of economy. Coffee is a pivotal part of the Ethiopian developmental agenda along with beer. Buying and selling beer, exporting coffee are activities associated with making a modern Ethiopia. Tala does not have such associations. Instead, it's relegated to an indigenous subsistent economy or a household as women are the primary brewers. Like Tala, Taj signals an indigenous past. A local wine with a high alcohol content, Taj is made from honey, sugar, water, and geisha hops. Um, today, Taj remains a popular drink enjoyed at cultural restaurants or tourist spots across Addis and has come to represent Ethiopian authenticity, sometimes in a kind of a kitschy way. However, Taj also has a duality in meaning. Yes, Taj was the drink of Haida Salasa, as one informant said, but it is a revered alcohol that materially embodies national culture. But Taj is also associated with drunkenness and riotous behavior, the image of an intoxicated man who stumbles across the street of Addis Ababa from Taj Beit, the Taj Beit is in the minds of some people, and these two imaginaries have given Taj two meanings, one of a high status in the context of celebrating Ethiopian culture, while the other assigns it to a riotous behavior when consumed in day-to-day -day life. Finally, uh, an interesting counterpoint, Areke, uh, areke uh, is a popular indigenous uh, liquor uh, long associated with backwardsness and drunkenness, but is undergoing a commercial makeover, making it negatively compatible with notions of modernity through bottling. The drink is a distilled and colorless liquid made from the same inputs as tala, but with a much greater alcohol content, which would go up as high as 50%. Today, the liquor is being bottled by Biharawi and Barazaf alcohol companies and sold to hotels and bars and groceries and restaurants across the country. It's generally seen as a low-class alcoholic beverage. I won't forget the first time I was sitting at dinner and I asked a family member what they thought of Arake and uh, Shamatia, Shama, Sham I believe that was what it was. Um, and the individual started laughing, saying, now that's low class, only the durier, delinquent youth, drink those drinks. However, commercialization has led to a distinction between traditional areke produced in households and bottled areke, which was shed, uh, which shed some of its low caste connotations. This is further illustrated by an encounter I had at the Sheraton a swinky hotel in Addis Ababa while asking a group of men about draft beer sales, I joked that the hotel customers are probably just drinking imported liquor, like the 3,000 burr cognac per shot that sits at the center of the office bar. Instead, they said that the sales of national drinks are like areke, are very high and more popular amongst customers. I remember being confused while listening to their conversation, stopping and asking, so the areke that comes from Dabur Brahan, they began to laugh and say, of course not, not the one from Dabur Brahan, not the stuff they carry in the jerica, which are like these buckets. They want to make clear that the distinction between the two, with the bottled version being acceptable or even desirable at the Sheraton, while the other is a sort of backwoods drink.
In this way, the presence of the bottle is enough to change associations uh, of the drink in the minds of uh, drinkers through its commercialization. Arake becomes the local beverage bottled in a modern way rather than a backwards or archaic form of consumption. This is also because Arake is also known to be dangerous, causing fatalities because of unknown alcohol levels and extreme uh, intoxication. The bottle introduces the safety of standardization as people are not transporting and selling it out of buckets. This way, it becomes more like beer due to its new status as expressing a kind of modernity through bottling. But how, so, so you know, I've, I've sort of gone over like how like the, these kinds of associations that are made um, between uh, traditional beers and tradition, you know, tradition versus sort of bottle beer, which is tied to modernity. But how does out beer come to embody both the past and present conflicts and the future promises of modernity? And what I present next is an analysis of four beer advertisements, which I'm going to read against each other to show how meaning um, or sort of uh, past, presents, and futures often end up having conflicting notions of what an Ethiopian nation is and what its future should be. So I want to start with this. So let me stop sharing my screen. And then we will So here's the first commercial. So, in this popular Heineken commercial, a giant Walia beer truck marches forward on a fleshly paved road past Aromo farmers and their cattle at the end of the barley harvest season. The trucks drive across mountainous canyons lush with green vegetation over a newly constructed beer bridge with a tunnel carved into the country's hilly terrain. Two Ethiopian men ride other horses side by side along the trucks as triumphant orchestra music plays in the background, but it soon turn breaks into Afro beats, chanting Walia Walia, Images of camels in the Oromo sycamore tree, a bridge from the Amara region, flash onto the stream before the trucks parade onto the city of Addis Ababa with you celebrating and drinking Walia beer. It ends with Walia Dratajin Kuratajin, our quality, our pride. Here, Heineken associates itself with Walia, an ibex endemic to Ethiopia. Which company chooses, which, which the company chooses as its logo, combining with sweeping images of the Ethiopian landscape, farmlands, mountains, and recently constructed infrastructure, roads, bridges, and tunnels, evoking a harmonious view of environment and development. As the Walia trucks enter the city, the celebratory African music signals the arrival of modernity in the form of Walia beer. However, this is not a modernity brought in by Europeans, but one that instead originates from the Kalinto Brewery in the Oromo territory, driven into the city on the roads constructed by the national government across different federal states. This, in this way, Walia beer signals an endemic developmental modernity brewed by and for the Ethiopian people. So in this video, you're seeing uh, multiple images that are evoking a certain kind of Ethiopia um, 
or vision of an Ethiopian development that's endemic, that is ethnic, that is developmental, and that is harmoni harmonious with the environment. And what we'll see as we, I have three more videos, that there are other kinds of imagery that emerges uh, through these um, commercials that oftentimes are maybe, are, are, are not really reconcilable. So let me move to the next commercial. So. All right. And then the Zamanala. The Zamanat Tamarco, what am I gonna? So this Abasha commercial begins with a young man sporting an Afro. He is dressed in a way that evokes 1960s Ethiopia. He irons his outfit for the day and the scene shifts. A woman inspecting her Afro in the mirror, another with winged eyelashes puts on makeup, another draws her in her eyebrows while another puts on a pearl earring. Next, a man walks through a the old city near National Theater. It cuts to three women nearby. Two are dressed in their Ethiopian Airlines flight attendant uniforms, dark green knee length skirt suits, while the other is wearing a chic traditional Abisha kameez. An Ethiopian airline plane flies overhead and the final cut shows a crowd in a theater and the outcome of a Miss Ethiopian competition before ending with the disco dance party. The Abisha beer commercial presents another modernity, harkening back to the golden days of Haile Selassie before the Ethiopian revolution of 1974 and the advent of an ethnic state. Glamorous young Ethiopian men and women, carefree, watching movies, dancing, and walking through the streets of Addis Ababa. This modernity is one of nostalgia and a desire for the return to a time in recent history marked by imperial rule in which everyone was just Abisha. This Unitarian view embedded within this idea of Ethiopia is implicitly against the ethnic state and the de developmental vision, one Ethiopian people for all time. So let's and I call this as beer as sort of a, a nostalgia for empire. So let's move to the next one. Ethiopia, Yemen, Stat Mahabra, Balbunich, Bet Bazian Zamenepper, the Dus Georgi Spiran, Habel and Mambati Jamarma, Bait Alia Lina, Labar and Natsin Touch, Ethiop Arvenuch, the Bacho Bagger Ficker, one Yachobaku Chetsigan, Yanin Yanaper, Africa and Net Majamarasi Wetan, Yanin Yanaper. Quasquak to Chachin, Bonch as has finished. Yan Ninanaper Badam Chama 
So this advertisement for St. George beer, a man writes on a type late writer narrating the long 20th century history of St. George beer beginning in 1922. From resistance against the Italians during World War II to the foundation of the African Union to the inauguration of the African Cup to Ababakila's victory at the Olympic Games in Rome to the present moment, over 90 years of history each time, repeating Yanne and Yanapa. Then we were. Commercial for BGI's brand, St. George beer does not evoke development, but an Afro-Ethiopian modernity that emerges from a tumultuous yet victorious 20th century history of Pan-African movements. This modernity places Ethiopia, hence St. George beer, named after the dragon slaying saint, at the center of all these critical events central to the formation of 20th century Africa, repeating them that then they were. However, this dual aspect of St. George reflecting the glorious past of beer while being charged as a corporate multinational since sold in 1999 as attention does exist within the brand. Finally. One more left. And finally, the Jano beer commercial begins with a Sol Mencinko, an Ethiopian and Eritrean string instrument, playing in the background, followed by a series of images of youth blending modern styles with traditional Abisha clothing. A woman opens up an old chest to reveal her own Abisha clothing. A Mencinko begins to play more rapidly. The youth prepare their outfits using an old singer machine, sewing, weaving, cutting, ironing, with traditional iron, of course. There is a focus on hair cells, braids, afros, blowouts, and curls. The music quickens and the Jano beer bottle appears on the screen as the sounds of the Mencico are blended with EDM music. The commercial concludes with an electronic dance party. The Jano beer commercial shows youth putting on a modern twist in traditional ways of dress and wearing one hair, but also taking the beloved Mencinko and electrifying it. This is a modernity that is hip and collaborative form of global blackness. It is not about evoking development or the past in thinking about the world, but a futurity in which the youth paint the world in their own colors. And in this in this kind of imagination of sort of like an Ethiopian future, it, the, the, it, it, it's kind of the sewing and the suturing of the past with the present in a way that is actually not quite politicized as the other three videos. But here you you see a kind of presentation of a future um, or an idea of what a future Ethiopia would look like um, that is very different from the others. So. As I wrap up my discussion, I want to pose two questions in the aftermath of my research. First, how can different nationalist images become seeds of destruction or even sites of schism for countries rapidly pursuing a developmental agenda? It's not just about longstanding disagreements and tensions from the past playing out in the present. It's more of a complicated problem of conflicting visions of the future and how certain groups come to blow over these different visions of what the country should be. Um, and, and just to clarify, what I'm saying is that as, you, as we sometimes think about conflict, we think about it in terms of reconciling the past or coming to agreement in the future, but oftentimes thinking about, or in the present, but often thinking about futurity, 
um, and 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 coming to an agreement on what future might look like can be actually uh, a sticking point, um, as as it's seen in in some of these um, these advertisements where you have different ideas and some of them don't quite mesh together. And, and secondly, how might we take seriously consumption and alcohol and brands, in my case, as a site of political fantasizing? And what does such fantasizing reveal about the fault lines between within a particular nation that is in re reconcilable visions of the future? And finally, how does such an approach challenge our understanding of the causes of violence in a developmental context? So with that, that is the end of my talk. And I thank you all for coming and listening. And I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and I look forward to your questions. OK, uh, thanks so much uh, for that talk. That was uh, outstanding, super interesting. Um, and we have a lot of questions uh, from the audience and some questions for myself as well. So let me start with a question that I think combines a couple questions from, um, from uh, audience members with a question of my own. Um, so part of that is just the question of, of who, who drinks beer um, in Ethiopia. And I think historically, at least in my experience in Ethiopia, particularly bottled beer um, has been consumed primarily by men. And what does that mean for kind of I guess statements of identity and performing identity and fantasy through beer, um, if it tends to be more of a, a item or commodity that's consumed largely by men. And maybe in relationship to that, one of the questions that comes from um, an audience member that's also connected with this is, is the issue of religion um, and the kind of the place of, of Islam in Ethiopia as a religion where you know, the vast majority of Muslims don't drink, um, don't drink alcohol. So how does that fit into kind of these representations of nationality, representations of the future um, in the form of beer as well? So I guess both in terms of gender and religion, um, how do those those uh, play into that? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, so in terms of who drinks beer, a lot of the people that I talk to, as you sort of ascertained, are men. Um, I try to get a lot of women to talk to me. And even though I'm a, a woman, um, they weren't really interested in discussing uh, their drinking practices or their or, or how one drinks, especially if you go in. I did a lot of bar work. And uh, oftentimes women might work as servers in the bar um, or even as like a bartender, but rarely, you know, would you see a woman drinking outside of maybe if she was in a company with a, with another male, at least in, not like in hotel situations, um, but in some of the bars that were on the outskirts of the city. So a lot of my like thinking comes from interviewing men because that was my sample and, and particularly men who were orthodox or protestant or non-religious in leading to sort of the question about muslims i you know dan that you have an article uh, on sort of drinking in ethiopia which kind of ad addresses this a little bit um uh, and they are sort of a huge population in the country and they do not drink and there were and there were there are non alcoholic beers that were being made that I didn't really talk about uh, in here. Maybe I should think about uh, including it in my discussion that uh, Muslims would drink, but there wasn't that kind of engagement through drinking, except maybe through um, giving, giving the example of uh, the Teddy Afro situation with Bud Delay. So people might participate in a boycott in reaction to a brand, even though they might not be engaging in drinking itself, if that makes it any sense. Yeah. They're, they're boy, their boycotting is vocal because they wouldn't be drinking it anyway, but they would be expressing their uh, distaste. Also, a lot of the farmers, the barley farmers who would work for Heineken were Muslim. Um, and, and that and that was, uh, so they would participate with the beer companies in ways that um, by this time Heineken had sort of alleviated a lot of those concerns, but they were working with a large Muslim population in Asalla um, on, on farming and they were giving them no interest um, loans in order to 
buy fertilizer and seeds. So there was kind of engagement with the, the Muslim population, but in a way that maybe doesn't have to do with consumption, but more to do with production. Yeah, that's really interesting how the Muslim population was engaged with production, but not necessarily um, on the consumer end of things, which I mean, I, I, maybe something to think about more is how does that then kind of lead to maybe a rereading or reinterpretation of, of some of the advertisements, given that they're kind of directed at a very specific um, section of the, the population. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and read one of these questions from the audience. Um, uh, so fascinating presentation. I'm curious about the regions that the hops are grown for, for these, where the hops are grown for these beers. Is there a political cultural meaning depending on the area the hops are grown? Also, I believe that beer and alcohol production requires much water usage. How does Ethiopia designate water usage for the different industries that require water for production? And are there congruent efforts to be more efficient with water use and water recycling? So for the first part of that that question, the geisho, um, so geisho production is like, there. I didn't pick up on any sort of political kinds of ties to the discussion of geisho. Uh, it, the, so there's the, that which is produced within the country that might go into like the production of Udge, but a lot of hops was also sort of imported from outside through the companies. So the, I would say the hops industry isn't like when you think about craft brewing in the United States, like hops is a really big deal. Um, and there's like a lot of conversation about where you source your hops. There's issues with hop shortage. There wasn't that kind of conversation in Ethiopia. At least I, I you know, maybe I might have overlooked it, but a lot of it is exported. Um, except for the stuff that's used in um, traditional drinks. Uh, but in regards to, I, th I think I, uh, what was the second part of that question? Uh, about water and oh, water. water. Services. Yeah. yeah. So um, yes, uh, when I was doing my work in the breweries, I would say that a good portion of my research, you know, or like when we would go through the breweries, they would talk about water treatment and water sourcing um, and, you know, engineers would love to talk about it. And it's actually something that I have left um, a kind of, because of time and like the, the large scope of my research, it was something that I've kind of put to the side, but I've, you know, talking to a lot of scholars who've become really interested in in uh, sustainability and alcohol in Africa, this question of water is something that I think a lot of people are, are starting to look at a bit more. Um, because yeah, alcohol and brewing does require a lot of water and oftentimes um, it will uh, it will take from other things uh, in the region, just as I would say barley farming and organizing farmers in a way to provide barley malt for the, the malting factory might um, undercut food security issues. Right, okay, that's interesting. So yeah, so kind of trying to balance these needs between food security and uh, of course the demands of the, the beer brewing industry. Um, I wanna ask another question. I, I was really taken by those advertisements that you um, showed at the end uh, of the talk. And this connects with a question from one of the audience members as well. So earlier in the talk, you showed the different bottles of beer and have talked about how they were connected with um, regional identities, class in one case, uh, ethnic identities. And then I felt like your reading of the advertisements was more connected with ideas about the future, the past and the future, which of course is also connected with uh, national identity. Do those map onto each other as well? I mean, do some of the visions of the future like that you discussed around Georgis, uh, Jano, these different beer brands, do those then connect with some of the other um, aspects of identity in terms of uh, ethnicity, national identity, class that you talked about earlier in the talk? So um, I would say it's uh, like in him it's not, a, it's an, it's a pretty close, but an imperfect layering, I would say. Uh, and there's one reason for it. And it's something that I didn't mention in the talk is that a lot of times Ethiopian beer advertisements, the people who direct them are usually um, really famous uh, artists in the country. 
and that's how they make their money. Um, like Gorgis and Abisha, I was talking to another scholar who did a lot of work on how beer, um, how the beer industry is really kind of funding artistic expression. And I and I looked a lot at like the work that they did to, um, especially to support musical artists and directors and, and stuff like that. Um, on a, on, a, on a more kind of positive level, but also they want the clout of those people in order to sell more beer. Uh, so what you're seeing is whoever, you know, and I and actually, I, I, I don't know who's the, the director of this particular video, but what they're doing is, so for example, the Walia um, commercial, right? This Walia, you know, you know I, I would say the brand is maybe, it's attached to definitely the aroma region because that's where the Calinto factory is. And that's where, the, you know, the barley farmers are. And there's a lot of uh, CSR that goes in in that region. So there's a sense that this, you know, factory belongs to us in this region. Um, but also uh, there is sort of these, and I think I'm trying to express it. There are these narratives that are kind of floating around in the country about sort of what Ethiopia should be, which are rooted in particular visions of the past um, and ideas about what's going on in the present. And they show up in these commercials in different ways. And I think my goal of putting four of them together was to show things that are almost kind of normal. Like these are common tropes that you see when you think about Ethiopia, like, oh, this kind of ethnic developmentalism, um, this kind of nostalgia for the imperial age, or, you know, this very like anti-imperial um, attitude. But upon like thinking about it a little bit more, you get a sense that when you actually have these different nationalistic ideas about what's going on, when you put them into a developmental project or an idea of what the future is supposed to be, I mean, it's rife for a conflict to emerge because some of these ideas are actually kind of against each other in some ways, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. And I mean, just a side comment, I was, that's interesting, just your point about hiring artists uh, to direct some of these videos, that makes a lot of sense given their cinematic qualities. I was, as I was watching them, I was struck by how different they seemed from commercials um, that I was familiar with last time I was living in Ethiopia um, and just the, that cinematic quality. So that, that explains that. But then as you said too, the, the complexity of trying to express that is really interesting. Um, I think we probably have time just for one more question. Um, so there was a question just asking to kind of clarify. I'll read the question and then I'll, I'll follow up on it as well. So the question is, does the state own the beer industry and use private beer companies to produce and distribute the beer? I'm a little confused on that relationship. So just maybe just clarifying that, but maybe a second follow-up question on that is given everything that you've said about the way that beer represents ethnic identities, Ethiopian national identity, represents ideas about Ethiopia's future and past. How does the the role of private international companies actually owning these beer brands influence um, those that sense of identity and influence those representations. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so in the 1990s, almost all Ethiopia's breweries, Badale, uh, Meta, Har, St. George, they were state owned. In 1999, St. George was the first brewery to be privatized and it was sold to Castel, which is a French um, international company. Ethiopia, the state, well, they put up the other companies for bid multiple times during the 2000s, every time failing until the early 2010s when finally they were willing to sort of relinquish their state-owned companies or their state-owned breweries. And that's when Heineken, Meta, and uh, or Heineken and Yajo came in and bought up the breweries. They started to expand them at a rapid rate. In response, St. George started to rapidly, uh, or Castel started to rapidly expand as well. And um, and at that time, the market also became more liberalized. So you had other kinds of uh, people coming in and you know pulling their resource together to create like breweries like Abisha, which have you know, local stakeholders, but also portions of it owned by international companies. So that's the the general landscape. So what I when I arrived in, to start my research, I was actually kind of observing, I mean, to use like an economic term, like 
the creative destruction in the process um, where you had this rapidly privatized industry that was changing and really pushing against local alcohol brands, but also reconfiguring the way in which the industry ran because with the previous government, like there were particular distribution networks that were state owned or not state owned. Um, they had uh, sycophants, like, you know, like kind of like, they're not part of the states, but they're part of networks that, uh, because in Ethiopia, distribution companies have to be separate from the brewery. Like, so they're individual distribution owners. Um, so there were particular Soviet networks in place. And when St. George, the first beer company came in, they basically leveled those uh, as it related to their brewing business and created new networks with young people um, who they said had a more entrepreneurial uh, mindset. And uh, and then the same thing with the newer breweries when they came in. They, they basically cleaned house, got new people, um, in order to sell beer in the way that they wanted to sell. And a lot of my research looks at this like recre recreation of the supply chain. Um, so that on, on that level and on the level of sort of you have these international companies and, you know, local, the, the weird thing about beer in Africa is that it has the opposite model than coca-cola so coca-cola is coca-cola wherever it goes um it's very american they want you to know that they're american um and that they're an international brand when multinationals come in what they tend or alcohol companies tend to come into a country they like to uh, uh, like cloak themselves in appear local so for example heineken will be referred to as walia Right. So Heineken tries to sort of hide behind a particular beer brand to appear local, even though it's an international. Same thing with, you know, BGI or Castell, like they hide behind the St. George emblem. And so there's a kind of politics there. And, you know, in some of my interviews, you see this tension uh, amongst people who are uh, they want the, the kind of development that beer brings uh from these outside companies, but there's this fear that it's kind of like a, a form of economic imperialism. It's a, it's kind of like a trick, like they're hiding behind like the bottle. And before long, you know, they'll sort of come out and you know, you know, did, you know, you know, cannibalize the market of, in some way. Um, so that was kind of a, like a huge conversation, and which sort of showed up. Uh, that, that, that's sort of the tension in the the St. George commercial, right? So people watching it would recognize that, oh, St. George historically has these kind of anti-imperialistic, you know, connotations. But here we have a development that is happening with the help of these multinational companies that are also kind of threatening our economic sovereignty, which is always sort of a big conversation in Ethiopia. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating and super complex relationship on this idea of representing anti-imperialism through a foreign-owned uh, company. And I imagine there must also be kind of issues of uh, cultural translation that are going on there as well. If a company like Heineken is trying to hire um, local, perhaps local Ethiopian advertising directors in order to then promote um, a very particular image of Ethiopianess. But uh, yeah, it's, I think we're, we are out of time, but I wanna just thank you again so much for uh, visiting us here digitally um, in Oklahoma. And I really appreciate all of your ideas and insights. And this talk has been uh, recorded. Um, it should be available through the Center for Peace and Development and the Security and Context uh, Network on their uh, websites once we get it all edited and uh, downloaded and that sort of thing. So if you're interested in that, uh, accessing the recording of it, you can contact me, um, Dan Maines. And just a round of applause. Thank you so much for um, visiting us here. And thanks for your time. And really enjoy the talk. Thank you so much for having me.